Hello and welcome to the 2016 International Trade Forum brought to you by the Maryland DC Export Council. My name is Kelly Leonard and I will be moderating this particular panel on trade finance. During this segment, we'll examine the financial resources needed to successfully do business overseas and how companies manage the financial risks associated with exporting. I'd like to begin the panel with um, some brief introductions. As Ellicott Dredge Enterprises International Trade Finance Manager, Marie Torres is responsible for delivering creative financial solutions to both domestic and overseas customers. For international credits, she routinely utilizes the short and medium term programs of the Export Import Bank and private credit insurance to support Ellicott's export needs in emerging markets. Additionally, she works with Ellicott's corporate CFO for the arrangement and negotiation of master credit lines for both U.S. and European countries. Elizabeth Thomas is a business development specialist at the Export Import Bank of the United States. Throughout her career, Elizabeth worked in the U.S., in Europe, and Asia as an international business executive. Prior to joining XM Bank, she held several sales, marketing, and health policy leadership positions. She worked with Hewlett Packard, InTouch Health, and other high-tech companies in the areas of wearable smart fabrics, robotic tele telemedicine, and medication life cycle tracking for hospitals. Jean Sutter is with BB&T's International Services Division. With over 30 years of international business experience centered in trade finance and foreign exchange, Jean provides clients and banking colleagues with practical solutions for doing business outside of the U.S. Having worked with a diverse range of clients from large corporate to startup, Jean's experiences assist in the development of focused game plans for the implementation of international business activities. And finally, Bill Houck has 30 years of international trade, trade credit insurance, and international corporate risk management experience. He's held management positions with the XM Bank and private sector concerns concerning specializing, sp private sector concerns specializing in asset-based lending, corporate credit risk management, and global capital market originations. Bill is currently SBA's Office of International Trade Regional Manager for the Mid-Atlantic Region. Welcome to our panelists. And I want to start this panel by posing a question to Marie, um, and really to get a better sense of your experience with trade finance and which resources you've used. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, trade and exporting as we all know, is very challenging. For a company like Ellicott, we have to compete with uh, very large companies overseas uh, with vast, much more greater resources than we have. But we have survived the ups and flows, the ups and downs of business by being diversified. Uh, companies have to be ready to uh, expand and not just rely on the U.S. market. So, so by doing so, we face greater challenges. But uh, trade finance products have allowed Ellicott to expand overseas and take uh, riskier markets, uh, <coughs> extend more terms of payment to our customers that have and that have enabled us to uh, complete sales that otherwise we would not have been able to. For example, uh, in the early 2000s, our company had very, very large challenges. Challenges that if we did not overcome, probably we won't be around today. But thank, thank you to the uh, assistance of uh, our local banking partner back then, 
branch banking and trust, whom I did not know was going to be in this panel today. So I'm going to be a walking advertisement for <laughs> BBMT, Thank you. as well as Exim Bank. Um, like I said, in the early 2000s, um, we had some major challenges that led our company to restructure. And um, you know, when a company is restructuring, it's very hard to find financing. Mm -hmm. In practical life, when you don't need financing, banks are offering you financing. <laughs> <laughs> but when you really, really need the financing, it's very hard to get it. But uh, thank you to BBNT and to Exim Bank. BBNT provided us a working capital facility that we that allowed us to uh, use our company assets, inventory and receivables, as collateral to the bank. But because of the credit profile, as well as the markets that we cover overseas, BBNT needed a credit enhancement. And that was in the form of an Exim Bank working capital guarantee. We started with uh, about a million and a half in credit facility. And over the years, BBNT was able to expand and grow our credit lines that allowed our company to produce more product for the foreign markets. Uh, what's one of the key things in um, being able to compete is having stock ready for immediate delivery so that when customers order our dredges, we could turn around and ship in a very, um, you know, uh, very fast turnaround possible. Um, that has also enabled us to be more competitive. At the same time, overseas customers also require uh, <coughs> terms of payment. And um, because banks generally don't lend again for, against foreign receivables, we had to get Exim short-term credit insurance to support some of our transactions which are not secured. For example, open account terms. If you have receivables that are not backed by letters of credit, usually banks won't lend against those, those receivables. But with Exim's short-term insurance products, uh, we were able to, uh, um, first of all, approve credit extensions to our foreign customers without requiring letters of credit. But letters of credit, of course, is very key uh, in, in ensuring payments from those uh, foreign buyers because it's a good thing to sell, but most importantly, we have to make sure as a business that we would get paid after we ship, either immediately after shipment or um, if we uh, approve deferred payment terms under the program that we're in with BB&T and Exim Bank, we could extend up to 360 days open account terms to our approved customers. We have to, they have to pass through certain uh, credit criteria, meet those criteria. It's not a freebie, but it, these are very good tools. So these are some of the um, trade finance resources that we used in the past, and still using to the very present time. Uh, we have also been utilizing private credit insurance in instances where um, we, c we wanted to extend more than 360 days and not use Exim's medium term program. Uh, and because of, because of the assistance we got from our bank and Exim Bank, uh, we were able to grow and acquire other companies in the same line of business. So uh, from about 2000 to 2010, 2012, our company experienced you know, steady growth <laughs> over that period of time. We have acquired th at least three companies in the U.S., former competitors. 
we also acquired one company in Germany. So we have full manufacturing capabilities in Germany, German-made dredges, and then also in the Netherlands. So Marie, you mentioned a, a lot of different resources yes. that you used um, through the restructuring and just through your business in general. One piece that you touched on was the whole private credit insurance piece. And so Elizabeth, um, my question for you would be um, actually kind of a two-part thing. How easy is the application process for credit mm -hmm. insurance and then how long does it take to mm -hmm. get a policy typically? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Kelly. Before I answer those questions, let me um, put what Exim Bank does in context so we understand where the questions are coming from. Uh, Exim Bank is a federal government agency. We were started in 1934. And the reason we exist, our mission, is to support U.S. jobs by facilitating the export of U.S. goods and services. And if there's one concept that I'd like you to take away from our discussion today, it's this. Small business is our business. So in the last fiscal year, 90% of the transactions that we did were to small businesses. And what I like to say is no company, no business is too small, and no deal is too small. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do that helps small businesses? We help small businesses primarily in three ways. One, to help improve your cash flow. Two, to empower you to offer credit terms to foreign buyers. And then three, to protect those foreign receivables from non-payment by your international buyers. And the way that we do this is we have a couple of, a couple of tools, and I'm just going to touch on two of them today. And let's use an example. Let's say you get a 30, that you have a customer overseas, contacts your company, and they want to place an order for $30,000 of your goods or services. And this is a nice order for your company. You're very interested in this. But you're concerned because you don't know this customer, you've never done business in this country. But on the other hand, it could be a new market for you. So there's some very good and compelling reasons for you to do this. One of the tools that we have is called export credit insurance. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's an insurance policy. And what it does is it insures your foreign receivables. So one example would be, an example of one of our policies would cover that $30,000 invoice up to 95% at a cost of 65 cents per $100 value of the invoice. So you take the $30,000 deal, you have export credit insurance, and, and you give 60-day credit terms. So your foreign buyer is, is um, requiring credit terms. So now you extend 60-day credit terms, you take the deal, the $30,000 invoice is covered by your insurance up to $28,500 at a cost of $195. So it's a pretty good deal. So now we're all excited because we have this customer, we, we can sleep at night because we know that the deal is covered, but we gotta go back to the office and we either have to build the product or we have to create the service to fulfill this international order and we need cash to do that. So as Marie was saying with Ellicott Drudges, what we do is we work with you and your commercial lender. So it could be bb and or any other bank. And we, the bank actually makes the loan to your company mm -hmm. and then we guarantee repayment of that loan directly to the bank and that's a working capital loan guarantee. So now we've got the trifecta, right? We've got the order, we're sleeping at night because we've got the insurance and we've got the cash to go fulfill that international order. That in a nutshell is really how we work with small businesses. There are a few restrictions to working with us. We don't support sales to foreign militaries. Uh, the content of what you're providing needs to be at least 50% US content and that can include overhead. It does not include markup, but it can include overhead. And you need to be working with a country, uh, excuse me, a company that's in a country where the bank is open. <laughs> so there are about 196 countries in the world, and we're currently open in 189 of them, and we have ways and links on the website to let you know where we're open for business. Mm -hmm. So back to the question, which was, you know, how, how easy is it and how long does it take? Uh, for the example I cited, it's a three-page application that's very simple. We have 12 offices throughout the United States where our field regional directors sit, and they sit down with you and they go through this three-page application, which is very simple, and then you enter it online, and from the time that it's entered online until a decision is made is about 10 working days. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's great turnaround. Yeah. And then as a customer, as a user of that, how, how did you find the process to work for you? Very efficient, uh, because it was our bank then, bb &T, that handled the application process. And the other advantage was BBNT had delegated authority from Exim Bank that BBNT was able to commit Exim Bank in a very fast turnaround time 
without getting Exim Bank to approve the application for our working capital guarantee. Ultimately, over time, we grew and we were profitable. We, we, we were profitable each year that at some point, BBNT was able to release us from the guarantee. So. Beautiful. So it yes. sounds like a textbook example, right? Exactly. <laughs> I, and I'm glad yeah. BBNT is the banker in this panel today. <laughs> awesome. And so, so Jean, let's let's hear from you. What are some of the different options and risks associated with getting paid in this foreign market? Very good. Well, thank you. And first, I've, I've got to thank both the, my colleagues up here for the good marketing and, and advertising with BBNT. And, and yes, just to to set the the groundwork uh, BBNT does do business in 120 countries throughout the world, primarily through dealing with our correspondent banking network. So that as we're dealing with you or your or your clients, we know we've got some good banks in countries to deal with. Um, you know, how do we mitigate the risk? Let me give an example, and uh, Elizabeth mentioned it earlier on. You you go to a networking event, uh, you meet up with someone who says. Boy, I, I, I like your flyers, and I'd like to buy fifty thousand dollars worth of them. Uh, your typical sale is two thousand, five thousand dollars. So, my goodness, what an opportunity we've got here! Fifty thousand dollars. Oh, but the the company is in France, and gee, uh, Gene, if you'll send us the product, we'll pay it once we get it in our, our, our at our airport or in our place, and. Uh, just, you know, just send it on. Don't worry about it. We got a great website. Here's my <laughs> business card. Go check it all out. Okay. Well, I, I'm still excited about that transaction, but why don't you pay me first, <laughs> and then I'll create these flyers and send them on to you, and and you know that, that, that's going to work out better for for my company. So you've got two people involved in the transaction. Uh, both of them want to proceed. How can I control this? both sides of the transaction. Well, one of the products, not only insurance, but one of the products we really talk about are letters of credit. What is a letter of credit? A letter of credit is something that involves two banks, and I talked about the correspondent banks that we deal with in the 120 countries, become involved in your transaction and from the seller's standpoint, give you a much higher level of comfort because for your buyer's bank to issue a letter of credit to your benefit, they've done a credit underwriting of that client in country. So you have now got that higher comfort level that, all right, if I fulfill the requirements of this letter of credit, XYZ Bank is ensuring that payment is going to come through to me. It also can include giving terms, as Elizabeth had mentioned earlier, which is beneficial for, for your sales uh, in, in that country. But again, it's, it's an insurance type of relationship that you have with, the, uh, with your buyer in the foreign country. How does it benefit them? And why would they want to give you that letter of credit? It's going to outline in the letter of credit what documents are needed for you as the buyer in France to pick up this product and to clear it through your local customs, your local regulatory requirements. You can also include in that letter of credit an inspection certificate so that before it leaves the U.S., you've got some comfort level that it's been reviewed and cleared. Often when we're talking to clients, prospects, consultants, uh, there's a concern, oh, it's, it's an additional cost and it's an additional administrative burden on me. Well, the costs are pretty minimal, typically three-eighths of one percent on the face value of the transaction. So once again, a good assurance on both parties' sides that if we fulfill all the elements of this document, we're going to get paid. It's a great way to start a relationship. Maybe you'll use a letter of credit for the first three or four transactions. You can then move to something called documentary collections, which still requires two banks to be involved, mm -hmm. but it does not have the limitations or the restrictions mm -hmm. of a letter of credit. And it's fairly, fairly smoother. 
Having said that, it also does not give the assurances that our letter of credit would have. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And so, Bill, from your perspective of SBA, what does SBA do? How do they help small businesses gain access to working capital so that they can participate in exporting? Um, first, it's really listening to, to the company, understanding what their needs are. Um, between the, the three of us, and I, I, I would challenge you to present a, a, a situation where between the three of us, there really isn't any export transaction that we can't assist with. We can't. So it's really understanding what their needs are. Is it pre-export working capital? Um, with SBA, um, we have programs that can help you finance that first dollar of export activity. So first, I need to understand where the company is in the evolution of their export business. You know, they've shipped to Mexico, they've shipped to Canada, uh, and they've seen, I think as Carl had mentioned, the profitability has, uh, um, is pretty good. The margins were 10% better than they were on domestic sale. Uh, so they want to pursue other markets. Uh, later, you're going to hear from the U.S. Commercial Service, and, and I, I believe the state of uh, Maryland, uh, and they might start a dialogue with, with one of those folks to start looking at new opportunities. So for that company, they may need working capital to change their website. They need, may need working capital to change their plans into different languages or, or into metric. So there may be a piece of working capital that's going to use just for export development activity, traveling overseas, trade shows, what have you. So I work with them and their lender to identify one of our programs that, that supports ex the financing of export um, development activities. What I tell these companies is that you really they need to understand the working capital needs well before they make that first trip overseas. They need to understand that, that uh, as Gene mentioned, you, know, you may do a $10,000 transaction here in the United States, but economies of scale, you might be in Colombia and you've got to fill a whole container, which is $50,000. All of a sudden, you're sitting at the negotiating tables at $50,000. Well, uh, gosh, uh, what do I do now? Well, you should understand your working capital capabilities well before you go. And you should also understand the tools of Exim Bank and the private sector. With Exim Bank, you should also understand how to use ex ex export credit insurance, again, before you start negotiating, before you start that, that first conversation, because you want to be able to pull credit terms out of your pocket if it comes to that, if, the, if you've got competition. So that's listening to the company and understanding what their needs are. That's, that's how I work with them and their lender to put them in the right program because we provide a 90% guarantee to the lender. Small business is risky to lend to for in, you know, for first part. Second part, you add the export element to it, it becomes even riskier. So we provide a 90% guarantee to the lender. And then if they're, if they're mature, so they're Elcott dredges and they're three years and they're now needing a revolving line of credit of $3 million for transactions and inventory, uh, bid bonding, uh, advanced payment guarantees, then I, then I coach them how to use that program and that's our export working capital guarantee. And then um, and I'm assuming that at some point in time, you know, they, they purchased three companies. We have, a, we have a program, our international trade loan program, where you can actually purchase a company that's exporting and finance it under our international trade mm -hmm. loan program and get 25 year financing for that. Yes. Or equipment or permanent working capital. So it's understanding what the needs are and plugging them into the right programs with their bank. Yeah, to add to what uh, was just mentioned, our company purchased a, uh, an operation in Wisconsin in 1998. SBA helped Ellicott with a guarantee under its 7A program where we were able to expand manufacturing capacity for the company through the equipment financing facility of SBA. Uh, it's a successful story uh, because SBA got, I mean, the loan got paid off. It was provided by a local bank uh, in uh, Wisconsin with a SBA guarantee and paid off on time. So, there, so as, as you can see, there really isn't anything that we can can't address. So, you know, I challenge you to come up with some type of weird scenario, <laughs> and I'll bet you we can solve it. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Bill, with the work that SBA does on, and the loan guarantee and all that great stuff, if I'm a small business owner, can I still work through my?
current bank, my current financial institution in order to leverage SBA, yeah. or how does that work? Well, I, 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 I try and work with as, as many banks as possible. So if they are working with uh, ABC Bank that's got 10 branches, that bank is not too small. Um, you know, you can work with bb and I think we have another bank here, I think we have Fulton Bank in the, that have international departments. So they could work with them as far as issuing a letter of credit or a standby letter of credit. Um, but a, a bank is not too small. So yes, that, that is my goal is to work with community banks and also credit unions. Mm -hmm. So there is no bank that's not too small. So if they're working with a bank, I don't immediately take them to, sorry, I don't immediately <laughs> take them to an international <laughs> bank. I want to get that bank who is already probably an SBA lender. Mm -hmm. There's 4,200 SBA lenders. So that covers a lot of banks mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I coach them on how to use our, our export program. So yes. OK, awesome. And now, what happens in the unlikely instance where maybe a foreign buyer doesn't pay on time or doesn't pay at all? How does that impact me as the small business owner? Like, what are, what's, how do I navigate that, those challenges and risks? Would you like to take that as, a, as an action? I'll, as I'll an give exporter? it a shot, though. <laughs> Okay. You're going to admit that you had losses? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, almost none in the last 16 years. Wow. Yes. Um, what we have done is to try to reduce our foreign credit risk exposure as much as we can. Uh, we realize that the cred trade credit insurance programs only provide up to 90 percent mm -hmm. most of the time so there is that exposure we try to cover that with margins and at the same time to be being very diligent with collections if we don't mitigate our risk with credit enhancements such as exims short term and medium term uh, insurance products or the private market, or by having the LCs confirmed by a U.S. bank like bb and a company like Ellicott would be so exposed, like uh, being out there in the lion's den, should the buyer uh, fail to pay for whatever reasons, whether it's country risk or if the buyer goes insolvent or just refuses to pay. But with um, credit enhancement, we are able to uh, um, ensure ourselves that at the end of the day, when it's time to collect, that we get our funds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very rare that we have to absorb the uh, un uncovered credit risk, as far as we are concerned. If, if we didn't accomplish that. I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. I would have been told to leave the company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's my role to make sure that uh, we get paid at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and let me add to that from the banking perspective. If you're a, a company and fortunate enough to self-fund, that's great and would be sad that you would have the loss, but mm -hmm. you could probably move on and, and, and survive. On the banking side, and this happens unfortunately too many times uh, than it should, you've had that, that transaction, again it was great, you decided to ship your goods and now they're sitting in port and the person says, well, wait a minute, um, I'm going to either pay you 50 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. uh, or come and get them. And I heard one of our previous speakers talking about trying to litigate in a foreign country, Very real true. issues. Uh, or they just string you out and you're yes. 30, 60, 90 days out. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, while your banker is there trying to help you, a couple of issues are going to come up. You were able to finance the, the shipment, but now you're doing your regular business. Your 30, one of your receivables is 90 days past due. Mm -hmm. Not only is it a foreign receivable, hey, why didn't you tell me you were doing a foreign mm -hmm. transaction? But What's the likelihood of you now getting paid on this in fact? And as the credit reviews coming up, as, as some of the requirements for your loan might get triggered because your cash flow has been dramatically impacted, if 
you don't have insurance, if you don't have some type of support, if you don't have a letter of credit, which would have gotten you paid either upon shipment or 90 days letter, later that you can show to your banker, mm -hmm. you're gonna have some type of issue. And again, your banker may not be able to renew your line of credit or, or even move forward with the current line of credit that is in place. So very important to talk to all of the consultants that you have on, on, on both the, the financing side, but, but more importantly, your banking side. So well, great the question. One advantage of having credit insurance is that after a certain waiting period, you can claim on the insurance and the insurer, such as Exim, will pay you either 90 or 95 percent of your invoice value as long as you comply with the terms of the credit insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you assign your receivable to Exim Bank, mm -hmm. who takes over the collection of the receivable, whether Exim Bank or the insurance company, uh, private insurance, whoever issued the policy, takes over the collection. So that relieves the U.S. exporter from going after the foreign buyer in his country and litigating or trying to recover the asset. It's very, very difficult. It's an expensive process. So I, I, I strongly thank you, <laughs> urge right. an advocate. Right. So just mm -hmm. to reiterate, yes. um, what Maria is saying is that if you have a loss in a foreign country and you're not covered, you have very little recourse. Right, you, you're as, as Jean is saying, you're going to go over, you're going to try to sue. You basically have very little recourse. Um, but I'd like to put in a plug for the Department of Commerce, U.S. Commercial Service, of which we are not a part. We're a very separate agency. I think I heard on the earlier panel, one of the panelists mentioning the Gold Key Service, which if you're not exporting yet and you're thinking about it, it's a tremendous service where mm -hmm. they have people in country who actually vet potential partners and companies for you. So there are people actually go out, they, they go to the company's offices, they make sure they're real, they understand their financial situation. And so it helps you mitigate your risk right up front by having, uh, you know, choosing partners from a pool that have already been vetted. That being said, even when you choose the best partner possible, you know, we have a client who had a long-term standing relationship uh, with an excellent customer for years, never had a payment problem, and then one day, their client didn't pay, mm -hmm. you know, and it just, it happens. I think all kinds of things happen. And in that case, as Marie said, it's just like an insurance policy. You file a claim and you get covered for the claim. So Bill, from your perspective, how does this all come together, like in terms of non-payment, delayed payment, what's, how does SBA get involved? Um, primarily through structuring, meaning that, that, that going back and understanding the needs of the company, I like to understand what their experience has been you know, what their accounts receivable uh, aging looks like, uh, and then guiding them as to how they can improve that. The nice thing about insurance, either private sector or through Exxon Bank, is it kind of forces you to sophisticate your credit shop. Um, you may have started at letter of credit or cash in advance, okay. but if you're going to remain competitive, you're going to have to offer terms at some point in time. So, so, um, so I'll look, look at, look, and I'll, I'll tell them, you're probably missing out on a lot of opportunities here by not extending terms. So I will coach them on the use of, of, of credit insurance and what their obligations are, meaning that um, under one of the programs, they've got to get, they've got to get trade references, they've got to get financial statements. They have to have a, they have to have a, a, a credit policy in place so they can show the credit insurer, Exxon Bank, that they are sophisticated enough to manage, manage a policy. Um, and to see what their balance sheet looks like. Can they absorb a loss? Um, if they are doing cash in advance and letter of credit, as I said, they're, they're probably missing out on opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, not, if you're not losing some money every once in a while, you're not taking enough risk. Right. Mm. I mean, I, you know, 25, 25 basis points, 50 basis, maybe 1%, if, you know, if you're losing that, that's okay. It, but you're not taking enough, not taking enough risk. So it's it's showing showing them that they can take risk, without without worrying about not getting paid. Showing them how they need to operate on a credit uh, basis, uh, and how it impacts um, um, their uh, relationship with their banks if they need to finance those receivables. Um, I'd like to add to that. Um, in although 
guarantees and insurance policies sound really great. The insured also has tremendous obligations to ensure that the policy remains enforceable when it's time to call on the policy. As a business, it is very important you document your transaction perfectly. You have to uh, uh, maintain your shipping documents, the bills of lading, the, uh, your invoices, your certificate of origin, and also prove that the, um, the product left the U.S. and entered the country. In some countries like Mexico, we don't ship by ocean, so you don't have an ocean bill of lading, but there's an instrument called pedimento, which you have to secure from the customer. And if you don't have a pedimento in a Mexican, trans uh, say, a sale to Mexico, and you claim on your policy, your claim will be denied. So it's very important to document each export transaction and keep those documents secured in a, in a place in your company where it's very reachable and could be compiled as a package when you present a claim. Hopefully you don't have to claim that you do, if you do, you have to document yeah, it properly. We're talking about products, uh, the DC metro area, a lot of IT mm -hmm. service providers. Mm -hmm. So for you I IT folks, we, you know, services are a big export. Yes. So um, okay. they're, they're, that's, again, understanding the, understanding the company, making sure they're documenting their services well, uh, properly, so that the bank is comfortable with those types of um, uh, invoices, those types of contracts. So for the folks in there in the, in the audience that are in the service industry, those are perfectly exportable, uh, uh, receivable. So. so we're gonna begin opening up the floor for questions, so if you do have a question, please proceed to the back of the room and we'll get ready to, um, to take those questions. And, and I'm gonna tweet your quote, Bill. If you're not losing money, you're not taking <laughs> That's right, that's right. That's great. I've been doing true. this a long time. If you're not losing it's money, you're not true. taking enough risk. Mm. Awesome, so along those lines, as a small business owner, I mean, these are all great products, but I'm assuming as the borrower, there must be some sort of guarantee, a personal guarantee or other guarantees that are expected oh, yes. of the borrower. Yes to secure these types mm -hmm. of financing. So can you describe for me what types of guarantees are required of um, or expected of borrowers? SBA, um, XM Bank in certain situations, they are a little flexible on the personal guarantees depending on the, on the balance sheet that they're looking at. SBA, we never waive the personal guarantee. So anybody that owns 20% or more of the mm -hmm. company needs to personally guarantee the loan. Mm -hmm. that, what that means is a signature. Um, you're not pledging personal assets. The only, the only assets that you're pledging are the assets that we're financing. Receivables, inventory, contracts. So no personal assets are involved um, unless it's a situation where there's such a lack of collateral that the bank's going to require some personal. But SBA does not require uh, uh, personal uh, individual collateral as part of the guarantee. It's just a signature that if everything goes south, we pay the bank off and then we go to the guarantor saying, now we have to work something else to pay, pay back the federal government. Okay. Having said that, I'll comment that your banker may likely go a little bit further on that. <laughs> how, many, <laughs> how many times will someone come and say, well, I, I, I've talked to XM and they will guarantee, I've talked to SBA and they will guarantee, so uh, I, I need the money by week's end. Well, we still are required to do a credit underwriting uh, on you, and while we love using these as, as support for our transactions, we're still going to look for a couple of things, including if we're willing to take the risk and if our supporting entities are willing to take a risk, boy, we'd sure like you to take the risk as well with us. So your personal guarantee, your personal signature is, is very important. Absolutely. And that's very important for uh, you as business people and, and, and consultants to know just because it comes with strong support we still want your skin in the game. Elizabeth, did you have anything you wanted no, to add? No, I think that's add? covered everything, yeah. Marie, did you have anything you um, wanted to add? I think they okay. patched them. Awesome. Everything. Thank okay, thank let's you. take our first question then. Uh, good morning, thank you for having me. 
My name is Eric Henderson. I'm with XCBG International Development Group. I'm going to ask all of you to pronounce that after the, after the seminar. It stands for Ex-Commerce Bank Group. I'm a former Commerce Department and World Bank for so thank you for my colleagues for their, their service to this country. They're going many challenging places. But my question is a somewhat of a technical question. I have admittedly failed on more than 70 XM deals, but I've closed about 30. Um, my, my question is two part. The first is, is it possible, typically in buyer financing, you have to get a 15% down payment from the buyer? Is it possible to get 10 or 8? Um, that's the first question. And the, and the second question, uh, and this is directed more toward Bill, if you're going to hire services, uh, lawyers, accountants, architects, engineers in a foreign country, how does SBA help with that? So I have one for the, th for the both of you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> on, on the percentage-wise, certainly the bank is going to do its particular underwriting and depending on the, the, the company itself and how strong it may be or not, we would determine what percentage we would want. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've got the guarantee of SBA or XM. Uh, so again, depending on the strength of the entity itself, would depend on how much cash in advance or down payment you would have. But, but yeah, please. I would just say that each situation is very different, and each one is very individual. And you know, we need to get into the complexities and the the details of each particular situation. Yeah, I, I, for the most part, on a, if you're talking about medium term, um, there, a 15% down payment is going to be required. There may be ways to finance that down payment, so it really depends on on, on, the, on the structure. But in most cases, you're going to they're going to require a 15% down payment. From the okay. perspective of an exporter, uh, when we deal with Exim's medium term program, the 15% down payment is a requirement. Uh, it, it can come from the buyer, and it, or it could come from us. We could finance, self-finance the 15% if we deem that the buyer is credit worthy. So somehow, somebody has got to put up the 15%, whether it's the buyer, or the exporter, or the bank. And then and that's Exim's requirement yeah. for medium term yeah. financing. And then on the, on the um, Financing of, of, of export development services, mm -hmm. in you know local council, uh, architects, what have you. Um, our export express program. That's the program where you can finance any export related activity. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely anything, as long as it's identified in the use of proceeds statement of a business plan that the bank keeps on file. Then you can finance literally any export related activity. And I think Exim's medium term program can cover a certain percentage of the local cost. Uh, you, you just have to consult with your uh, loan officer in the structured financing department. May I ask another one? Yes, sir. Quickly, sure. Quickly. To, to our friends at Ellicott Dredges, the person that trained me was Walter Mather at HSBC. Yes. So have you in the past ever gotten a, uh, a waiver against the local bank guarantee since you do so much exporting to Africa? What do you mean local bank guarantee? Oh, the, uh, uh, local bank support. Correct. Yes. Uh, I work with Walter very ac actively. Um, he's Walter Mather, uh, that uh, our colleague here mentioned, covers uh, West Africa for Ellicott. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, we have close to 100 Ellicott dredges on ground. They were primarily funded through letters of credit from local banks, which I get confirmation from U.S. banks like BB&T and others, or s some Western European banks. There are instances where we can waive local guarantee, uh, provided that the local buyer uh, is credit worthy from the perspective of uh, after reviewing uh, financial statements of the buyer. We have extended open account terms with Exim short-term insurance. Cooper, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Good morning, everybody. My name is Gabe Omar with the Maryland Small Business Center. And I'm, I have a question for XM Bank, SBA, and BBNT. Uh, so my question is, uh, it looks like you guys talking about companies that are ready 
you know, in an up and running, you know, studies. So what, what about startup companies? Um, you know, what are the ABCs of getting a business loan? Uh, and my okay, second part of the question is, um, do you find that, uh, you know, financing companies to certain countries much easier than certain part of the world? Let's say Canada or Mexico will be much easier than South Africa. Those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, as far as startup, um, our, our minimum um, requirement is a company be in business for at least a year. Okay. Uh, the likelihood that they're going to have a balance sheet and income statement and cash flow statement to support a line of credit after one, just one year of operation is, is, is it's unlikely. Um, so uh, both SBA and, and just from a basic credit standpoint, um, a lender is going to want to see you know, a favorable, consistent operating history. You know, maybe break even cash flow, but they want to see some profitability and, and, and some retained earnings on their bet, some, some capital retained. I have looked at, and I did approve two years ago, a company that was eight months in operation, but the two principals had both put in a half a million dollars each, and they had two million dollars worth of firm orders. So, uh, and they were on based on letters of credit. So, in that situation, management had experience, they had sufficient capital, and they had very firm orders based on secured terms, uh, letters of credit. We gave them two million dollar line. So that that's an exception, mm -hmm. but we require a, at least a, a year in, a year in business. Okay. And from the banking perspective, we would look at a startup, but that is where the personal guarantee, the personal assets, gee, can you leverage your personal real estate mm -hmm. to, to get it going? But as Bill said, any financial institution will really be looking for some type of history, a year, a, a couple of years worth. But the startups, because certainly in this market, we have so many people uh, because of the international aspect that have relationships in countries, see opportunities. We like to try and work with them, but it is a much more difficult process and requires a lot more personal investment. So for us at Exxon Bank, most of the companies have been in business for three years. There are some exceptions to that. If you have someone who's coming from an industry they've been in for 25 years, there may be an exception. Mm -hmm. Companies have to have a DUNS number from DNB yes. and some either financial information or a tax return. And do you guys find easier to deal with some countries than others? So we have what's called a country limitation schedule. It's mm -hmm. on our website. And currently we're open in 189 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So there's only a handful where we're not doing business. Yeah, similarly, we'll, we'll rely mm -hmm. on Exim where they're doing business, uh, look at the transaction specifically and, and see mm -hmm. how we could deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the insurance products that were talked about will probably a, be a big part of, of the transaction, but yeah, we're, we're, we're open. And that's why it's good before people start to get involved in a transaction to talk to all of the assets that they, they have available, Department of Commerce and their financing element. Yeah, some, some markets have a stronger rule of law as far as, now if you're in the service industry, um, I recommend companies you know, on their service contract, uh, and I think the, um, the, uh, the chemical company that was here, they talked about their 25-page 20 distribution, distributor agreement or partnership agreement. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's great, you could use a rule of law, you could use Southern District of, of Manhattan as the, as the jurisdiction, but I, you, you wanna make sure you have proper leverage against your buyer on a service, uh, contract, but you want to have make sure that that's tested in in the local market. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a hard time, even with credit insurance, but if you're going to have a hard time perfecting that contract in country because you haven't tested that language in that contract. So other, you know, some countries have better rule of law than others. Um, others have uh, some countries have a a wide selection of commercial banks that can help with either foreign exchange, letters of credit, documentary collection, and others have very limited, right. maybe one bank. So it really depends on it really depends on the market, but uh, there's certainly certainly differences. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So from the perspective of um, financial payments, so tell us, and this I'll throw this out as a general question, tell us which factors relating to financial payment payment are different when selling internationally as compared to selling domestically. So just an open question. Would you like to take it, Marie? I'll start. Okay. okay. Uh, 
there's, of course, lesser challenges selling domestically in terms of, uh, you know, pursuing collection efforts. And most importantly, the asset remains in the U.S., such as what we sell. A dredge is a large piece of equipment. If a bank finances or we finance the, dr the financing or, or provide supplier financing to the buyer in the U.S., uh, uh, filing of security interest under UCC is affected. That um, results into a lien filing, meaning even if we have sold the asset the dredge to XYZ company in the U.S., we still have security interest filed legally in, in the U.S. so that in the event of a default after we've pursued an exhausted collection efforts, we can locate where the product is in the U.S., where the equipment is in the U.S., and we can repossess. Take it back to our ware warehouse, our yard, refurbish, either lease or rent to another customer or resell either to another U.S. customer or a foreign buyer. Now, there's more challenges when selling overseas. First is the asset leaves the U.S. Once the asset leaves the U.S., it's a lot more difficult in the event you have to foreclose. Well, our company has reached a stage where we are able to self-finance our customers on a case-by-case -case basis. What we do is, what we've done and what I've structured is a program similar to how banks uh, book loans. We uh, have our own promissory note. We, we have other documents which the foreign buyer is made to execute, such as a security agreement, and we also require personal guarantees. We use local counsel in the U.S. who does all the documentation for us, files a UCC here in the States because the documents are governed by U.S. law, in fact, state of Maryland law. But what we do as another step is we hire local counsel in country that will perfect our security interest in that foreign market. So it's a much more involved process. And uh, we hold the paper. Uh, it's reflect those uh, are reflected as either short-term or long-term receivables in our books. And uh, hopefully we do not have to claim, because if we do, we have to enforce our rights legally over there. And we have to uh, take the asset back from, say, Mexico, or let's say, not Mexico, further out, because Mexico is connected here. Say, Nigeria, we have to ship the equipment back from there to here, and that's a cost. Legal fees add up. So we, we try to add all those into the price. Uh, we charge legal and documentation fee for supplier financing mm -hmm. transactions up front, which we collect. Okay. So we're like a bank. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Get a letter of credit. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've got that credit underwriting of the customer, and of course things can blow up yeah. uh, in, in, in the term, but yeah. you, you've got a bank involved. Yeah. You've got your local bank. You've got the bank that they've chosen to deal with. If it's confirmed, as Maria said, you've added a higher level of assurance to it. But until you've got a comfort level with a client, that is a cheap form of insurance. We insure everything else mm -hmm. in our businesses, in our lives. But it's, we it's know that businesses have to compete and times are very uh, difficult now with the drop in oil prices, uh, major currency, I mean currency devaluations in the merging countries. It's very, very difficult to sell. So we've got to be creative as a business, as an exporting company. we got to really go out of our way because we, f we compete with very large companies overseas who, who literally would sell their product and say, just pay me back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, as a, yeah, a loss All leader. The, you, you, we, we, talk about, we, we talk about letters of credit, mm -hmm. you know, those types of terms of sale. I mean, 
right. open account 30 days, letters of credit, cash against documents. But you also have to understand um, the costs associated, like are you picking up the insurance? When do you pass title off to the buyer? So what's called INCO terms. Right. So you've got your net 30, you've got your, but you've got to understand what terms you're going to sell on as far as who's going to pay for the shipping insurance on, on the sale of a product of a good. When does title pass? Does it, does it ta pass when it, when it lands on the ship? Does it pass when it gets off the ship in country? You need to understand that really well, and that can be very industry specific. Mm -hmm. So um, that's part of the terms that you need to fully understand as well, because that affects the cost of the transaction. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to make a point that has really nothing to do with your question. But um, so I'm a former small business owner myself, and I know what it takes to run a small business. And you spend pretty much 24 7 trying to run yes. your business. And if I were sitting in your seat, I might be thinking to myself, I'm hearing all these challenges about exporting. Why would I want to, it, you know, is this going to be a distraction? Is this going to take away from my business? There's so many challenges. Why would I want to do this? Yeah. So I just want to share three examples of clients that we work with. And this is all publicly available information on blogs and websites. And they've done webinars with us on why a small business want to think, might want to think about exporting. <coughs> we work with a medical device manufacturer out of Florida. They increase their revenues 400% because of exporting. We work with a plastics manufacturer out of Indiana. It's a veteran-owned small business. They do 65% of their revenues now are from overseas exports. Mm -hmm. And then we work with a company in uh, New Jersey. They're about to appear in, a, in our blog in a week or so. They do heavy uh, construction equipment. And they managed to survive 2009, 2010, because they had enough money. Then 2011, they started laying off employees. And then 2012, when their export business really kicked in, it saved the company. And they were able to go back and rehire their employees. And they're really proud of the fact that they have a, a, a we're looking for a mechanic sign in their front uh, uh, lawn in front of their office building. They're really proud of that. And so it is challenging. I'm not going to say it's not. But you have so many resources that are at your disposal between the Department of Commerce, the US Commercial Service, private industry, SBA, Exxon Bank. We all work very, very closely together to try to help you. We, we know what the pitfalls are and we know what the challenges are, and we can try to help you mitigate those challenges. At the same time, two companies uh, have to diversify. In uh, economic side, you know, economy goes up and right. down, up and down. Sometimes US economy is up, so companies don't heavily, are not too heavily reliant on exporting. But in our case, there was a time when the U.S. market was so depressed, and if we weren't exporting, we would not have survived. One year, our export business uh, contributed over 90% of total consolidated sales. Awesome. Yes. Let's take our final question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brenda Harrington from Adaptive Leadership Strategies, and you've certainly made a compelling argument for considering exporting as part of your business. And a lot of what you've said and what has been said in the first panel coalesces around cultural differences and just understanding the, the host environment. So I'm curious about what types of risk tolerance or risk uh, premiums you assess uh, you know, when, when there is a higher likelihood of, of something, you know, not coming together. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would think, yeah. I mean, you're pricing to risk. Pricing to risk. I, I mean, most definitely. I mean, it, both on the international, on, on, the, on the credit side, mm -hmm. uh, overseas, you're pricing to risk. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's going to be, if it's going to be cash in advance, you're going to have one price. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have net 60 days, you're going to have another price. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to Ghana or a, a, a developing market where there, there is a likelihood of a, an extended period of non-payment, mm -hmm. then you're going to price your product to, to address Very the cost of funds. Mm -hmm. And a bank's going to price to risk as far as the, of the, the risk of the small business. Exim Bank also, their premiums escalate depending on the country risk, their perception of the country risk. And as an exporter, we have to pass that on to the mm -hmm. customer by adding the premiums yeah. and other expenses that we anticipate into the selling price. And, and so just to clarify, so Maria is 100% um, correct for some of our products, and for some of our products it doesn't. So. Okay. But another, if I can make another pitch for something, uh, understanding cultural norms can make or break your business. Yes. You know, as you know, you're going into a foreign country, it is so important to understand 
you know, what are the social nor cultural norms, what are the business cultural norms, and again, there's a lot of resources that can help with that. Yeah. Awesome, and on that note, we are going to conclude this panel. Marie, Elizabeth, Jean, Bill, thank you so much for your insight and your expertise. We appreciate you. Thank you all for joining us on the live stream and here in the telev television studio. We look forward to our third panel. Thank you.